Wall Street Unplugged looks beyond the regular headlines heard on mainstream financial media to bring you unscripted interviews and breaking commentary direct from Wall Street right to you on Main Street. How's it going out there? It's August 22nd. And I'm Frank Curzio, host of the Wall Street Unplugged podcast, why I break down the headlines and tell you what's really moving these markets. You know, I, I've been at this game for quite a while. 25 years. Pretty amazing when you think about it. To retirees, it's exactly what you love to hear when it comes to someone giving you advice for investing. To millennials, it's probably the worst thing. Like, man, Curzio, you must be freaking old. 25 years. Just true. <laughs> I'm getting old. I feel older now. But over these years, I've seen so much take place in this industry, remarkable things. Just uh, extracting information, how fast you can, different services, systems, social media, online newsletters where you used to have to deliver it. Right? I used to have to be licking stamps from my dad and, and, and put them on envelopes and stuff in the envelopes and bring it to the post office. That's how you used to get newsletters. Think about that. It used to take... The time you finished writing it, it was probably another two weeks before that pick or your sense of the market got anything. Anything you believe in about the market just got to someone's doorstep was two weeks later. If you're the younger generation or have probably been doing this for, for less than 10 years, that, that's insane to you, right? Because especially today where you know everything has to be inflated, stories have to be inflated, and you know, just the markets move like crazy and algorithms. It's kind of amazing when you see what takes place, at least, again, over the last 25 years or so. Even when it comes to television, right? Financial TV, CNBC. And I remember going there. My dad used to take me as a little kid. Maria Bartiroma. And she was just a she was just a kid at the time. Wow, I was just a young, young little guy. He used, to, he used to take me to CNBC and Bloomberg and all these places. And, you know, it's matured from having a few anchors to becoming an industry leader when it comes to the amount of people watching. You know, I've seen Bloomberg grow tremendously. I used to go there as well. My dad was on TV when I was younger. He used to take these little kids, sit in a chair, watch them on TV. Warren Buffett was there once, and we're talking, man, I was just a little kid, and we're talking over 25 years ago. It wasn't like Warren Buffett now. I mean, he was definitely popular. He was rich. It was a big name, but it wasn't like it is now, and I remember asking my dad. I said, because you know, he was like excited. I didn't know who this guy was. I was little at the time, and he's like, oh, it's Warren Buffett. It's Warren Buffett, and again, he was a big name back then, but again, not like today where there wasn't social media or anything. And I said, Dad, why don't you try to get his business card or something? And I'll never forget what he told me. He goes, son, guys like that, they don't have business cards. <laughs> it took me a while to really understand that, but it made a lot of sense. And uh, my dad actually wrote uh, a book, which is a short book, and he sent it to Warren Buffett. And Warren Buffett actually wrote back and said, thank you so much. I loved it and signed it. It was real signature. You know, he just signed it himself. And, and you know, I have that letter today, which is pretty cool. But it's awesome going to all these places and – yeah, just uh, really cool stuff, right? Who knew? I mean, people were really high on Buffett then, but now forget it. It's insane. I mean, you can't even get a ticket to, to go to his conference, uh, the annual conference in Omaha. But just really cool stories. Also, we see Fox Business News, right? They came out and doing a different thing, and I have was anchoring it. Not anchoring it, but I, I was on there pretty much three times, sometimes four times a week at one time, for Fox Business when I was on Wall Street. I mean, all great platforms for individual investors who want quick updates on, you know, what's going on in the markets, right? Just put on the TV. If you want to hear from some of their favorite analysts, right? Also a good outlet. And you know, I've appeared, been mentioned by these sites numerous times over my career. But the one thing that really bothers me is the model. And because their models back then, it used to be, we need to have high quality analysts on. When my dad was on television, there was only like 10 people and he was one of them that you listened to. It wasn't like thousands today. Different opinions, all crazy. There was only a certain amount of people that were on. And again, it was a lot smaller, tight knit community, not as many investors around. You know, Gabelli was one of them. Navalier was one of those people. I mean, people that you still see in the industry today, incredible. Sue Herrera was doing a lot of those interviews, CNBC back then. But their models have transitioned from having these quality people that know what they're talking about and good analysts with good track records to entertainment, right? Which means more page views. 
And I'm not knocking them for doing that, right? They're businesses. They need to generate profits. That's how you do it. And I guess it, it makes sense for all media companies. It's a company like Disney, right? Owns ESPN, where they gave the Arthur Ashe Award to Caitlyn Jenner, right? An award for bravery. And this award they gave to Jim Valvano, who, who after that speech, it didn't take long for him to pass away. I mean, someone I'm a huge fan of. Uh, I'm a huge college basketball fan. But he came up with that, an amazing speech, right? Jimmy V Foundation, which raised tens of millions of dollars for cancer research now. Pat Tillman, right? Left, you know, he's playing football. Left to serve his country, died serving his country. Billy G. King broke through glass ceiling for women. Nelson Mandela, Muhammad Ali. But you have Caitlyn Jenner, who's a media, and I won't use this word, all, you know, begins with a W and an H. I won't use it. Would really only do this, accept the award, if Disney was going to really mention or back her new reality show. And it's such a controversial figure that they know that it, a lot of people are going to watch it. They want people to argue about it because that's what's going to get more page views, more advertisers, more money. And even with that, I get it because these companies have to generate sales, earnings, cash flow. They have businesses. They have shareholders. So it makes sense of financial media outlets like CNBC, Fox Business, Bloomberg to have analysts on that program that make bold calls. You know, like the Peter Schiff's, the Harry Dent, the Tom Lee's. Not picking on anybody here. Just saying. Because they're able to take those crazy 50% crash calls that they've been predicting for the last five years, or Bitcoin's going to whatever, a million, 100,000, 200,000, and they'll turn them around, use them as headlines on their website, and they'll get tons of monster page views and generate a fortune, right? Which is what you want to do for your shareholders. Again, I'm not, because I'm clicking these stories as well. Just bringing up a point here. And to be honest, I really don't mind or hate the bold calls if truly, right? If that analyst truly believes that after his analysis that the market's going to crash, that's, you know, that's fine. If they're right or wrong. I have conviction in my stocks that didn't work out. I get it. I, I'm okay with that. Now, what I do hate, and the point I'm getting to here, is there's no accountability. I, mean, I rarely see these anchors calling out the analysts for being dead wrong, especially the bears for over the past eight years. On the same thesis, our debt's going higher, our debt's going higher, our debt's going higher. In the meantime, stocks are going higher, higher, higher for seven, eight years. I mean, change your thesis, find out what's wrong with it, but don't go on TV like you've been right all the time. It's very frustrating. It's okay to be wrong. Yeah, All of you, I don't care how great you are. Look at Einhorn. I know Einhorn's one of the best investors. It's five years now. He's going on a horrible streak. He won't change, which I'm surprised. He's not changing his style and sticking to his style. I think you need to adapt and you're going to hear it great. I'm telling you this interview is going to be fantastic coming up in a few, which talks about this, not just focusing on one style of investing. It's very important. You see me do this in both of my newsletters. A lot of growth picks in those newsletters have done fantastic because a couple of value picks I picked early didn't do that. Well, it's not a value market. People don't want value. They want growth. Now we're doing great in a lot of those portfolios. But they don't call out these analysts for being dead wrong. Or calling out the analysts that made bad picks, right? Last time they interviewed, like just a month or two later, which they do on Fast Money, which I like. And you'll see Kramer get called out on these as well since he's on CNBC every day. But for the most part, a lot of these guys are on the show, especially early on CNBC, Bloomberg, they don't really call them out. And you're looking at it, most of these guys make these crazy predictions. Why? To get airtime. They get huge publicity after the fact, right? They get on there, they make a crazy call, and then what? It gets mentioned every place. There's going to be a place where this guy's from. You're going to get people going to CNBC, see this guy, want to learn more. Then they're going to click, go to his website. They're going to get tons of new names, people visiting their website. So basically, they're taking on zero risk for making these crazy calls. And a lot of times, they're crushing the people that are listening to them. Like in October, I wish I can go back. Because I, I got so much heat for this. And again, I talked about wrong picks. Now I'm going to talk about something that I was right, dead right on, which is retailers. The big box retailers, department stores, everybody was just like, I mean, the same guys that are on TV right now because retailers are surging uh, were telling me Best Buy was going out of business. Oh, they're in trouble online. They're, they're dead. And, and you know, Macy's, Kohl's, these guys can't compete. And, you know, you, you go in during the holiday season, you can't even get a spot in the mall. These guys are jam-packed. I mean, they're not dead. It, 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 you look at it, is it decline? Yeah, it declined, but they're figuring out the mix between online and big box. There's a reason why Amazon's opening big box shops. There's a reason why Microsoft is. There's a reason why Tesla is. There's a reason why Apple is. 
I mean, Best Buy figured it out because people are not going to buy, well, not just Best Buy, but people aren't going to buy clothes online, right? They're going to go there. They want to try them on. It's important. And when it comes to a company like Best Buy, which had a 52-week high, company that have been bullish on for how long? They found a way to, to compete with Amazon. They learned. They adapted. Because no one's really going to buy a big screen TV online. They want to try it. And they used to go to Best Buy, try the TV, and then buy it for 15% cheaper on Amazon. So Best Buy said, you know what? We're going to match that price now. You come in. We'll show you the TV. And not only that, we have our services division, which is Geek Squad, and we'll throw it on your wall so you don't see wires all over the place. And they make incredible margins on that. Smart business model. But companies are learning to compete. It doesn't mean they're going to completely go away. And now you're seeing retails up tremendously from October. And the same guys that were saying the industry's dead, it's done. The malls are going to disappear. They're on TV right now saying, oh, the retail is great, great sector to invest in, right? There's no accountability. I'm watching this like laughing, laughing right now. And I, and I feel proud of it because I remember I was on stage where in one of the conferences in San Francisco, and there was like seven of us at the end of the conference, and Rick Rule was there. I think Jim Ricketts was there uh, on stage, and it was a pretty big audience. And he asked Rick Rule, do you want to ask anyone here a question? And he actually turned to me and said, you know what, Frank, I want to ask you a question because you cover all industries. What industry do you like right now? And this is like, think, at the beginning of November. And I said, buy department store retailers. I said, big box retailers are not dead. They're trading as they're going out of business. They're actually making money, generating cash flow, but they're completely out of favor and they're overdone. I was proud of that call. I was proud that Rick Rule has been in the business for 40 years, actually had a lot of people to choose from. They asked a question, they asked me. I was kind of honored by that. Big fan of Rick's. But just the accountability thing. There's no accountability. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to start a product that, that held analysts accountable. And if you're a great analyst, you love this. Why? Because you worked your ass off to, to make a name for yourself. Put in the hours, learn, made those mistakes over a long career. And what do you do? Now you're watching other people get on TV and create newsletters and make a fortune, not because their performance is better, they worked hard at you, but because they're making stupid, bold calls that results in page views, that results in people purchasing their newsletter because they want to learn more about, oh my God, the market's going to crash 60. How many times have we heard the market's going to crash over the six, last six, seven years? Think about it, guys. How many times? The same guys are still calling for it. I mean, if the market literally crashed 50% from here, they'd still be wrong from their original call five years ago. It's insane, which is, again, we, we get things wrong from time to time, but these are the guys that are seeing more business than ever. Just scaring the hell out of you. And you know who gets hurt? You. The investor gets killed because you're listening to these guys. You're subscribing to their products. You realize they're full of crap after you subscribe to their products. It's too late. But that's what we're seeing a lot in this industry. And in a, not just the newsletter industry, but in the industry in general. And we even had hedge funds using the media. When have hedge funds used the media, right? I mean, what, Ackman getting on and Icon. I mean, you never saw hedge funds get go on TV ever, ever. It's insane. Anyway, this accountability thing was a big deal to me and something that I've heard from you guys. And we created a product called the All-Star Portfolio, and that avoids all the hype. It's about getting real stock picks from professionals that we track to make sure we're partnering with the right people, that I'm putting the right people in front of you when it comes to interviewing them on podcasts. If a guy comes to his podcast and recommended seven stocks, 10, 10 stocks over a year period, and nine of them are down 60, 70%, and each time he came on, he never talked about those stocks, I'm not going to put him in front of you. It's my responsibility not to put that guy in front of you. Even if it's a big name that I know is going to increase the viewership of my podcast, I'm not going to do that to you. Because I'm not in this for a six-month you know, check or getting tons of people to listen to this, getting some crazy guy on here. It's a big deal. There's a lot to be said of that. I mean, it seems like the right thing to do, but I guess it must be hard to do because a lot of people don't do that. Oh, we can get the, we can pay these guys and get these guys. They got a big following. Throw them into this sector that's hot right now, and then they get wrecked. They get destroyed. So All Star Portfolio is created because of you from hearing from you. It's a new product. It's a newsletter where I take one pick from the experts I interview on this podcast every week. Well, not every single week, because sometimes I do interview CEOs, 
right? So I'm not going to, you know, obviously they're going to talk about their company, not all the time, but most of the time I do have analysts here that give a lot of picks and we take one of them and throw it in the portfolio. And sometimes they'll mention this pick during the interview or they'll mention it offline before or after the interview and talk to me because that's what we do. We talk about picks, different things we're writing about. And now you have access to an amazing network that I'm you know, always humbled by, but it's one of the biggest out there, one of the biggest on Wall Street because I've been doing this podcast for 10 years, interviewed well over 1,000 people. I mean, having that network allows me to see what other people are doing. Doesn't mean I'm going to say, wow, you like the stock. But when people mention it, I put on my radar. I see what's going on. I'll watch for six months, a year, two years. But just getting familiar with it, understanding it, and then knowing that story, and then just, you know, hey, all the sites that I look at and watching the stocks and just watching where these things go, and you'll see it come down 30, 40% on a bad quarter on something temporary. I'm like, wow, I know this story. I'm familiar with this. Maybe I'll call up that contact and say, hey, you know, you still like this stock? And they'll be like, yeah, I still like it. I love it. I'm buying more. Well, that's cool. That's a good recommendation there. Buying a stock that, that a great analyst like, you know, 30% higher and now, you know, came down again in the market where algorithms are dominating. If something goes down 10%, it's down 30% at the end of the day. So that to be a great stock pick. So having, this is a way I ha have been able to get great ideas, you know, having a network of people. And now I could share that with you. But we take these stocks, track them in a portfolio. It amounts to get to around three picks a month. So it's almost every week you're getting a brand new idea from a great analyst, one of the best in the world, where we put 15% stops on these positions, right? We want to limit our downside. Also, you know, that creates a little bit more turnover, which is cool because at the end of the day, if you're a subscriber to this product, you're going to have, you know, 40 something stocks in a portfolio at least, and you're not going to be able to buy them all, but it's always giving you fresh ideas. We'll also write up a quick report on these stocks. We'll include the analyst name the company they work for. Again, we want to give them credit and stuff like that. And we'll profile the company, talk about the fundamentals, highlight the catalysts. And then most important is we track the performance because that's accountability. And like you see with me and my products, I mean, you can go back six, seven years in our archives for Wall Street Unplugged. I've been mean, doing this for 10 years on, on you know, other networks and stuff like that, even at street.com. But you can listen to all my recommendations, all my podcasts, everything I was saying on Curzio Research, you can go and look archives for, for every single newsletter I wrote. We don't take those offline. And yes, I have a few picks that I regret, just like everybody else. But the winners far outpace the losers. Or well, you wouldn't really listen to this podcast, you wouldn't be subscribed to my services. And the day that doesn't happen, I say this all the time, is they all stop doing this. But you can go back and see this. It's not a bold call that I was making so like for eight years. And then when you see a 20% market correction from here, I'm like, hey, I told you about it. I told you it was going to crash. You tell me it's going to crash. You know, when, when the S&P, you know, the S&P's up 100% since then, you're still wrong. But they're going to take credit if it does come down now because they just keep calling and calling and calling it. And it's crazy. But accountability has been such a huge thing for me throughout my career. I mean, that's what I was taught at a very early age, even from my dad. And I think it's, it's a huge benefit to individual investors. Why, you know, listening to a complete idiot that's on TV because he makes a bold or stupid call to get attention, and you avoid that. Yeah, I'm not saying this as a shameless attempt to, to sell a product or to promote a product here, but since we launched also a portfolio newsletter a few months ago, and by the way, if you're a lifetime Curzio Venture subscriber, you get this product for free. It's one of the benefits, but we've gotten amazing feedback. When I look at this, this product just makes sense, and that's from after hearing from you on so many levels. You know, Accountability, we talked about already. We track the performance of every analyst I interview, but also you're getting stock picks from my huge network of expert analysts, a network that took me 25 years to build. And these picks are awesome because they include long, shorts, value, growth, small cap, large cap, international, everything. And I can tell you there's not a product out there that's like it. That's why I love it so much. And what I like best about it is it's a cool introductory for new listeners. We get new listeners all the time coming to this podcast, and they want to learn more about you. New people coming to the platform, first time seeing you. And this is a good product for that because you get to see, like, hey, what's Curzio all about? Let me see this newsletter, accountability. Have all these analysts recommending picks. It's pretty cool. And for us, we charge an incredibly high price for this newsletter. It's very expensive. It's a dollar. 
The All Star portfolio is a dollar. Why do we charge a dollar? It's the same reason why Dollar Shave Club charged a dollar. Because it said, here's our, here, here's our razor. It's the best. And we're going to charge a dollar uh, for 14 days. And after that's $9.95 a month after that, which is like two lattes at Starbucks a month. But Dollar Shave Club said, hey, we have a great razor. Try it. And once you do, we know that you're going to stay with the product because it's that amazing. Because we have something that's amazing to sell. So it's not a high price sale. It's not anything. It's a dollar to try it because we know once people try it, they're going to stay in it. And they've been staying in it. Getting very few cancellations. Dollar Shave Club sold its business. What was it a billion dollars, right? They grew that business too. Amazing. They created that commercial. Just go look at the story. It's kind of amazing. Unilever bought it for a billion dollars. They disrupted a massive industry right under Gillette's nose, right? Let me figure it out. It's kind of amazing. That's what we're looking to do here. Here, here's quality analysis for very, very cheaper than anything out there. And you get to track it so we're not full of shit, which is important. And it's a dollar for the first 14 days. If you like it, don't do anything. And it renews for $9.95 a month. Very simple. If not, just call us and cancel. Very simple. We're not going to convince you or try to say, oh, you should. No, it's very simple. If you like, you like it. You don't, you don't. But it's just a way when it comes to accountability, tracking performance, and getting the proper research in front of you. I understand the entertainment factor. I get it. We want to be exciting. I travel all over the world. I try to, you know, it, it, and I try to be exciting, but a lot of people find that exciting. They find the stories exciting. They think the podcast is funny with the introductions and stuff like that. But in the end, you, if you're paying for this stuff, you have to make sure that analyst knows what they're talking about. You have to make sure they have a good track record. And the only way to find that out is to really track them. And this is a way to do it. And every analyst I talk to about is on board with it because these are great analysts. The analysts who are not on board. I haven't talked to anyone that interviewed who's not on board, but I can picture people who don't write their newsletters, don't do anything. I'm like, no, 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 no. Don't throw anything in there. I don't want you to track me, which is a red flag. And you'll never come on this podcast. I'll never interview you again. You'll never be part of this platform because you should be held accountable. You're going in front of a lot of people. You're using my platform to do it, to get your word out to a lot of people, which is cool, but make sure that you're honest, make sure you're a good analyst. And this is a way to track the all-star portfolio. But listen, you have to listen to me about it. If you want to check it out, www.allstarportfolio.com. Okay, it's literally a dollar to try. You can find all the information out there. Or you can ask me questions if you want, frankcurzyresearch.com. But again, everything's on allstarportfolio.com if you want more information about it. And thank you so much, guys, for the feedback. And I get a lot of questions, and that's why I did that introduction. Again, it's a dollar. I'm not going to make a fortune off this. It's not a sales pitch. But you need to be, or you need to have the proper people in front of you giving you advice. And that's one of the things that, that disgusts me with this market because there's so many people that should not be giving advice on TV and the media, and they do not understand that responsibility that sometimes hundreds of thousands and millions of people are listening to you and following your advice while you're just taking in money and you're getting richer, not buying any of your recommendations in your newsletter, any individual investors are getting destroyed. It shouldn't be like that, and it's got to change. That's why I created the All-Star Portfolio. Speaking of great guys, interview one right now. Someone who speaks often at the prestigious Value Investing Congress conference. A lot of major conferences around the world that he speaks at. Former bank analyst, incredible source. Love this guy. That's Chris Mayer. I know he hasn't been on for a while. I know a lot of you guys love Chris because Chris gives you out-of-the-box ideas. And he's going to do that today. It's a fantastic interview. Please listen to this because it's so important and it's, you're going to learn so much here because we go really in depth about how he has a certain style of investing and something else worked tremendously that he said, you know what? I want to understand why that worked. And it almost forced him to learn new styles of investing. So you don't want to be a value guy 100% of the time. You don't want to be a growth guy 100% of the guy because you're a value guy. You're getting destroyed like Einhorn. If you're a growth guy, you're doing good now. But when the market does change and it will in the next year or so, you see a lot of these growth names, which we're kind of seeing now. Facebook, Netflix, Tesla get hit now. You got to be able to adapt and use different styles of investing. Hopefully you've been learning a lot from me. But Chris is going to go over that. And he's going to give you two industries that he loves right now. And I'm saying two industries because it's not like, hey, you should buy technology and healthcare. No, two well, way off the radar industries that he likes. And he's going to share at least three or four stock picks with you like he always does. Awesome, awesome interview coming up. Trust me, guys, you're going to love it. Then in my educational segment, I'm going to break down another strategy I use and I've used in the past to make exceptional returns in one of the most volatile sectors in the world. And the strategy is going to sound absolutely crazy because it flies in the face of almost every investment book you ever read. It's a really cool stuff. Now, before we get to my educational segment, let's 
get to my interview with the one and only Chris Mayer. Chris Mayer, it's been a while, man. I mean, a couple few months since you've been on. I'm getting a lot of requests for you. Thanks so much for coming back. Oh, well, thanks for having me on. I'm flattered. No, nah, I'm flattered to, to have you on, man. I love talking to you, and, and we're going to get to a lot of good topics today. But before we even get to these topics, I, I wanted to get your thoughts. The questions that I'm getting, I'm sure questions you're getting, we're seeing markets touch all-time highs again, uh, continue to hit new highs, right, for the past few years. Uh, what are your thoughts here? I mean, I've had you on plenty of times over the last two, three years, and we're saying, you know, you got to be cautious. Like, you know, we use the word cautious. We don't like you got to sell everything. You got to be careful. But yeah, you know, since we've been saying that a lot over the past two years and stocks keep moving higher, I mean, how did the average investor play this market where it seems like they're worried, they believe stocks are expensive, but it's going higher, but yet they've been thinking that for the last two, three years and been out of this market. How are you uh, telling your subscribers to play this market right now? Yeah, well, I mean, on the Bonner Private Portfolio, we still have quite a bit of cash. I think we're 25% cash or so. So uh, I'd say... You know, you want to have a good cash cushion now to take advantage of prices when they come back. Um, but like you said, I never sell everything. There's always interesting things to do. We're we're found we're finding interesting opportunities. For example, around Europe, um, we have quite a few European names in the portfolio that are that are cheap, and there's because there's macro concerns there. Euro's fallen, and so you're able to get some things at some pretty good prices still. Uh, and then there's still individual industries that you can dig in and, and, and find things that are out of favor. Energy names, shipping names are, are out of favor. We can talk about that later. But, yeah, I mean, my playbook doesn't necessarily change that much. Um, as the market gets higher and more frothier, the S&P 500 anyway, it becomes more difficult to find, to find things. But generally, that's always the case. I always say it's hard to find stuff. No, definitely. I mean, in this market where a lot of stocks are touching new highs, not not a ton. I would say less than half the S and P 500 is at new highs. Believe it or not, well, that's but, true. You know, you know, you made a good point. It's not not that all these. There's quite a few companies that are well below. So, uh, you know, and there are some challenged industries that like retailing or uh, real estate tied to real retailing. Those have been problem areas, of course. Um, but you know, I just find there's always stuff to look at. If you just keep your head down, you look through a lot of names. Uh, you're going to find some interesting things. Now, one of the things that you use, which is interesting, right? We call it capital cycles. It's something that, that, that you talk about, that I've already talked about before. Uh, I want you to get into this part because this is, uh, you know, money leaves sectors and investors. It's almost like a, a strategy that you use. Could you talk a little bit back? So you say capital cycles, people are like, you know, what do you mean? Is it money flowing in, flowing out? But you're actually using it sometimes to... to to time the market, to time certain sectors as, you know, inflows and outflows. But but you're better off uh, explaining it to everybody and talk about it because it's a really cool strategy. Yeah, well, I, I think it applies mostly to cyclical names. So it's always difficult to invest in stocks that, are, that you know are very cyclical, uh, whether they're automakers or airlines or shipping or whatever, energy. And so the capital cycle, capital cycle will give you a way to kind of frame that um, – to frame those industries and give you when you should become interested in them. And it comes really, most of what I know about that capital cycle theory came out of a book that uh, came out in 2004. It's called Capital Account, a Money Manager's Report on a Turbulent Decade. And Edward Chancellor wrote the introduction. Chancellor wrote um, Devil Take the Hindmost, which is a very popular financial history book. And um, an analyst that works with me read this book recently, and I, I had read it when it first came out, and I still had my hardcover anyway. It led to some internal discussions about it, and I took out my copy and, and reread some of the passages I had highlighted. And I guess one best, the best way to maybe explain it is just give like a mini case study. And, and this mentioned in the book just in passing, maybe half a page or, or three-quarters of a page on general dynamics, which in 1993 went from – uh, sales got cut in half, uh, and yet the stock uh, went up sixfold. So, you know, how does that happen? How do you get a stock that? How do you get a? Uh, how do you get a stock that where the sales get cut in half and the stock goes up sixfold? Well, I went and did a little research on that uh, on that name, and it was interesting to see. So, in the early '90s. Uh, defense spending went down by about a third. So there's a lot of capital leaving the industry. A lot of the major players are losing money. General Dynamics itself made zero profit. And so wh what happens here is you have General Dynamics cutting a lot of capital expenditures. 
uh, really shrinking the business. The, the assets uh, of the business went down by like a billion and a half. So they sold off unprofitable things, shut down unprofitable lines, and the profit went from basically zero dollars a share to like four dollars and fifty cents a share, and the stock went went nuts. So, in a little snapshot, you can see how how that happened. So you have an industry that just tanks. But what that does is it pulls a lot of capital out and pulls a lot of expenses out. People, you know, the remaining survivors in that pool then tend to do well. So the general dynamics template is kind of, I think, the essence of the capital cycle. So when you, when you want to be interested in these industries is after they've already had this collapse and you start to see capital come out and you see um, you know, cuts and uh, uh, people and capital expenditures and the, sh the general shrinkage. And that's when you really want to get interested in these cyclical names. Chris, there's a lot to be said for, for you know what you're just talking about because I know you as a value guy. Yes, I know you you invest in growth stocks and things like that. But I know for me, I've always felt like you're a pure value guy, and you're just looking for cheap assets you could buy that you know they're going to be worth a lot more at a later date. Then you come in and you see general dynamics, which kind of throws a wrench in that, right? Because you're like, wait a minute, sales are coming down, earnings are coming down, but yet the stock moved fivefold. So you're yeah, you know, because of, it kind of conflicts with what we're, we're used to, right? I mean, you, you ran the research that to find out what happens to become a better investor. And I think a lot of people, yeah. right? It, it's kind of like so many people stick to their strategies. And you hear people, well, gold's going higher, gold's going higher, no matter what, right? And you hear, you know, the market's right. going higher, market's going lower, and they don't change along with the facts. But the fact that you're able to go learn something that you're like, wait a minute, why did this happen to become a better investor? I mean, uh, sure. there's a lot to be said for that, I think. I think also it helps to have multiple uh, arrows in your quiver. I mean, if you're a one, if you only have one trick. Sometimes, you know, you get through periods in the market cycle where it's just not really wise to do anymore. And so, if you have multiple things you can do, and um, it expands the opportunities you can look at. So, I don't only use this, and I don't only invest in cyclical names. In fact, I'm very reluctant to do I invest in cyclical names, and I don't have very many of those type names. But every once in a while. You know, you you do look at them, and you get a couple of uh, very interesting opportunities that way. So I I think, to your point, yeah, you don't want to be wed necessarily to just one uh, market view or one strategy. You want to have a few different things that you can go to. Now let's use that strategy because there was a couple of sectors that you mentioned, which I was surprised at, right? Because people are like, oh, it's technology and healthcare, and I actually make a joke about it <laughs> before before uh, <laughs> in, our, in my intro. And you're like, let's talk about these two. Stuff. And it, it kind of it, it's cool because we always get new ideas, new things. But one of the things you mentioned was uh, was shipping. I mean, this is a, yeah. an industry that's kind of been out of favor, which is kind of a you know weird if you think about it from a common sense point of view, right? You're seeing our economy do very well, and Yes, shipping is international, but you would think with goods and services and things like that, maybe tariffs have hurt these these guys lately. But yeah, it, it continues to be out of favor, and this is some place that you're looking for value. Yeah, yeah, and I think you know with shipping, it's been out of favor for a long time. But what really put it on my radar recently was with all the tariff talk, it created some panic there. Um, the world's largest shipping company, which is a company called AP Molar Maersk, lost one third of its market value this year, mostly on tariff talk and this is a stock that had already been already been pummeled so I think one of the more surprising things maybe people don't appreciate about shipping is is that well I think a couple things one is that 80 percent of the world's trade goes overseas uh, on ships and if you look at things like well look at like bulk recently I looked at bulk carriers and dead weight tons and I went all the way back to I think it was 1980 and just year by year see how much was shipped and Almost every year it goes up. There was a couple of years where there was some retreat, but it was marginal, or maybe where it was kind of flat. But you'd be hard pressed uh, to find any kind of recession, or I mean, even during the OA crisis, the dead weight tons and, and dry bulk went up substantially. So that wasn't really the problem with shipping. It wasn't a demand side um, problem. It was that the shipping companies ordered way, way, way too many ships, and that. Uh, supply overwhelmed demand, and then you had day rates, day rates for those ships collapse. Um, just to give you an example, I have here that the, in 2007 it cost 126,000 a month for a cape size vessel, and in 2016 I was down to 9,000. So huge, huge drops. Obviously, maybe it isn't obvious, but a lot of companies are not going to be able to survive that kind of a downdraft in their revenues. And so you've seen 
capital come out of the shipping industry. You've seen a lot increase in scraps, and fleet growth has finally slowed. So, um, you know, you, for years and years, it was growing about 8% a year on average, and now it's really dwindling. So I think you're at an interesting inflection point with, ship, with shipping. Now, do you think shipping will – could you relate it, and this might be crazy, but – you look at the airline industry. Remember Buffett, right? He used to just say that these are death traps or if you want to lose money, buy an airline and things like that. Uh, but this is it wasn't a demand side problem, right? People needed to fly. You need to fly. And they figured out the business model that actually works. And even today, you're looking at these companies at all-time highs, and they're still trading some of them you know, below 10 times, 11 times earnings. Uh, I guess people feel like, is this for real or not? But the amount of cash flow to generate a lowering debt – can we see the same thing in shipping where they figure it out since you know the biggest thing it's almost like Facebook, right? I mean, I think the biggest thing with with Facebook is get all the users on one site and then kind of figure it out, right? Instead of doing yeah. the other way around where you have all this demand here, it's like how do we generate the most margins off of this that keep it because like you said, since nineteen eighty it's going higher and higher and higher. Why are these shipping companies going lower, lower, lower? It doesn't make sense. Yeah. Well, I might figure it out and possibly in the in the analogy with airlines, uh not terrible because you know what really helped to turn airlines around too is the, just a limited number of gates, and so you finally you have airlines where they can kind of protect their routes. I mean, there are some places, you know, from city to city where you can't fly there. If an airline wanted to create a route, it couldn't do it. I mean, it's just there aren't the terminals, there aren't the gates, etc. So uh, that helped airline profitability in in, uh, in many cases, and in some extent, it might happen in shipping. There are so many ports and there's so many slips and bays and all this kind of stuff. It creates some limitation, but I think shipping also is interesting if you break it down a little. So shipping is a big, big, big topic, but certain segments of it are particularly attractive. And so this takes me to look at uh, things like, say, uh, natural gas. So, you know, you look at in the U.S., natural gas production is up big over the last 10 years. And if you look at uh, LNG exports, liquefied natural gas exports that we export from the U.S., to, say, Asia and Europe, that has really exploded. If you were to look at a two-year chart, you'd be amazed. I mean, it's, it's gone up probably 10x. It's just a huge spike up. And if you look at other things that are similar, you look at, like, propane or pop up or ethylene, you would find similar these similar huge hockey stick moves. So there's demand because U.S. prices are so much cheaper. We have all this huge supply of, of low-cost natural gas, and... You know, it's a good 60% of what buyers will pay in Asia or Europe. So there's this big cost advantage. So naturally, how do you, you know, how does the market solve this? Well, you know, you got to ship it over there. And so this is actually not really a, a new story. This, this has been, well, I'll give you an example through a company called Navigator Holdings. That's a shipping company we like. And that went public in, I think it was 2013. It went public about 19 bucks. And I have four sell side uh, reports on that company at, that date from that time, and they all tell the same story that I basically just told you, which is that the U.S. is going to export all this low-cost stuff and how there's this big cost arbitrage and blah, blah, blah. And by 2014, the stock went up to $31 a share because people got excited about this story. It makes so much sense, and, and you know, it seemed like a cinch. But, of course, uh, it took much longer to happen than people thought, uh, to get the infrastructure in place, and so then the stock's just been crushed since, and and fell. I think it got as low as seven. We bought some at around eleven, and um, but now it's it's starting to happen. So you've had a thesis that's been in place for a long time. It's not really a secret. You can see it. You can see these terminals being built. Uh, if you were just to search, you know, LNG terminals, export terminals, you'll see all this all these facilities being built to take. Uh, you know, this product that's trapped inland and to get it to the Gulf so it can be transported to Europe and, and Asia. Uh, but it's just been very much delayed. So you're getting now, you know, you're getting that story at much discounted price and you're much, much further along. So that's, I think, uh, where shipping can be very in interesting because there's only so many ships that can carry uh, LNG. It has to be a very, special, very specialized ship. You can't refit a ship and make it transport LNG. You can track every vessel used to transport this stuff. You can look at the backlog, and there's, I think, a couple of ships 
this year. They're going to come online, but I think there's no ships for the next two years, and it's not just something you can just turn key and, and start up. So I think that if you look at that particular sector, there's some constraints there, and I think the shippers could make a lot of money in the next few years as this plays out. Talk about LNG, because I know this is something else that you like, which uh, you, know, you mentioned w with Navigator here. And it's funny because I covered this story for such a long time, like 2008, 9, 10, and watched the yeah. Shell Revolution and how they said it can't be used for oil and also it was used for oil. But it, just take people back re really quick, because with LNG, guys, I mean, we, we built facilities to basically um, – import natural gas. And they were like, wait a minute, we have a lot of this stuff and it takes massive construction to actually reverse that and say, okay, we're going to start exporting it. But talk about that whole process because this has been a, a story for a while, but why do you like LNG now? Is it, does it have a lot to do with pricing where natural gas prices are, are much higher almost every place else in the world? But uh, why now should we really be getting into this? Because I know there's been a story for a while and these things ran up and have come down, but maybe it fit, fits into the, you know, the, the, uh, your, your strategy, right? Capital coming out of the market is a good time to own this. Yes. Well, I think to answer that question, I, uh, I would take a little bit of gran granular details. I won't go into too much, but just like to give you an example. There's a large pipeline, Mariner East 2 pipeline. It's going to bring on something like 275,000 barrels a day of propane, butane, ethane from the Appalachia to the East Coast, which will then be exported. And if, so if you just do the math, that going to require, you know, X number of additional vessels and so many more, you know, of these vessels for short trips, blah, 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 and you work it out and you, you figure that, uh, you know, there's, there's this imminent demand for ships and a company like Navigators actually has the most of those kinds of vessels to carry that, that product. Uh, so it's, it's kind of getting a picture of you know, the supply, like I say, you, you get great detail. Actually, with navigators, you can go ship by ship. They tell you when it, when it was built, how much, you know, it paid, or how much it, how much it was cost to build, what it carries. So you can, you can get that level of detail. And then when you look at some of these facilities online, you can, you can do the math and figure out how many ships they're going to need. So uh, it's kind of interesting that way. Um, there's a lot of transparency in it when you get down that small. Because, again, this is just a – just one little sliver of the shipping industry. It's, not, it's different if we were talking about dry bulk or something like that. But uh, So that's why I think you get interested in it now, because this stuff is coming online very soon. In fact, I think there's a big export facility that's going to come online early next year. So this stuff is starting to happen now, and the stocks are starting to react just a little bit. Uh, it's come off its bottom, and it's, had, it's basically – traded reasonably well for a while now, but I mean, it's so far off from where it could be and what it could be worth. Like I, like I said, it hit $30 a share back in 2014, basically on the excitement of the same story, but it didn't play out that way. It took longer. And now they have more ships than they did then. And that's the other thing that's interesting. And this is, this is one of the things I, I love to look at when you have a company sometimes goes public and then it's a dog for four or five years afterwards and people look at it and they tend to think of it as a, you know, kind of like a bad investment. But if you ignore the stock price and you just look at the company, you can see they've actually done pretty well. Like in Navigator's case, for example, you look at book value per share, you know, since they like, oh, you know, say over the last 10 years, it's up maybe 70 or 80% in book value per share. So they're, you know, they've been bumping along doing okay. But the difference is that the price the market wants to pay for that book value has declined. So in 2013, market value to company at over three times book. And today it's valued at 70 percent of book. So, you know, you're at a crazy, you see the crazy extremes. And if, if you just get a rebound to something like, you know, a premium, to, a slight premium to book, you can make a lot of money on something like this. So that's, you know, that's kind of the thinking behind it. Let's get talking to Chris Mayer. I, I, I want to go into two more topics with you really quick because, uh, you know, I love these conversations. I could talk to you for hours, actually, but we are limited. Uh, I, I wanted to talk to you about the banks, which I always mention. <laughs> Uh, because you're a former bank analyst, you, you know uh, more about this industry than so many other people. And when I saw the stress test come out and I really dug into the banks and I'm very familiar with this industry, uh, I came to, to, to realize, and I actually said this publicly, and I think you know I got a lot of backlash for this, but I said, guys, you know, because we're always worried about you know another 2008 type crisis. And so sometimes we don't realize that it's how rare it is where last time that happened was a Great Depression. And, and yeah. when I started analyzing these banks, I actually said, guys, look, if you're worried about 
another credit crisis. It's probably not going to happen in your lifetime. And that doesn't mean that we can't see the market come down 10, 20 percent, right? Because if we didn't have it, it wasn't really like the CDOs. Uh, it wasn't so much uh, uh, the subprime. It was the amount of leverage that was in the market where you only needed a small decline in housing to really disrupt the whole entire system where it could it, it almost resulted in the end of Western civilization if we didn't come out with a bailout. Um, but now with Dodd-Frank and, and how much capital these guys have to keep on, on their books to withstand a 35 percent market pullback, was 10 percent unemployment, a fall of more than 5 percent GDP and a 30 percent decline in home prices. I mean, we didn't even see that during a credit crisis. And the fact that they would leverage over 30 to one, even 40 to one in, in you know, uh, pretty much six, nine months leading up to, to, to their bankruptcy. And now it's 10 to one and then being monitored all the time. And, my, and, and we agree a lot of stuff, so feel free to go off on me if you want. <laughs> but for me, I could see the market coming down, but not to the point where runs on the banks and stuff like that could happen. What do you think of someone that's an insider in, in this industry? Yeah, I mean, the way I, the way I think about it, too, is, um, you know, we always uh, reflexively think back to 2008. And, well, because it was such a dramatic experience, so I, I can't help but sometimes think, uh, you know, 08. But, I mean, you're right. I think the way you might, you might not have an overall credit crisis like that depth, but you'll have pockets of problems. That's the way it's been with banking for years. They get in they get into trouble in little pockets here and there when something happens. So, you know, you have, uh, you know, maybe uh, maybe subprime auto will be a problem for some banks. Uh, will it take down the system? No. Will it will it lead to bankruptcies in banks? No. You know, will it, will it maybe lead to some banks taking some hits? Probably, you know, some. But um, I, I think that you're right. I, I think since the crisis, the banks are much better capitalized, and they're still uh, – I don't know, and I don't. I won't say cautious. It's hard to generalize sometimes because you see, mm-hmm. um, you know, some of the small banks, smaller banks, I think, are still generally pretty cautious and are just doing plain vanilla things. It's much tougher to get a mortgage generally than it was ten years ago. Uh, so there's not there's not that particular problem. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, we have, for example, a bank called CIT Group, and. I think that's an, that's one of the cheaper large banks around still. You can get it for a slight premium of book value, and it's very well capitalized. It's sold uh, – it needs to have an aircraft leasing division, which it's, which it's sold, and it's slimming down, and it's uh, – it's, I think it's a, it's a good bet here. It's got a CEO, Helen Alamani, who came out of retirement to run it, and um, she's done a good job fixing up, and they have targets for return on equity. And if they hit those um, and get something uh, evaluation more in line with peers, you have a 40, 50 percent uplift in the valuation just from today's numbers. So uh, I still think there are interesting opportunities in banks, and and um, so that's how I would frame that. Okay, and last thing here. Uh- because uh, you work directly with Bill Bonner. You mentioned his name earlier, Bonners and Partners. And um, you talk to him all the time. <laughs> when it comes to the portfolio, since it's kind of like, you know, both of you guys run that polo field, do, do you ever actually take advice from him or do you just tell him, hey, bud, back up, I got this? <laughs> and I'm joking, of course. And those of you that know, you know, yeah. Bill Bonner is, is the founder of Agora, the biggest financial newsletter published in the world. If I had to use a football analogy, I'd say he's like the Robert Kraft, who's the owner of the New, York, uh, New England Patriots, of the newsletter business in terms of building one of the greatest franchises in the industry. But you know, when you work side by side, you have such a good relationship. I, I'm curious to know that behind the scenes, is it like, hey, let me – did he sign off? Does he come up with ideas? Or you're like, no. Because you know, knowing you as a stock analyst uh, and, and your picks and you have an amazing track record, I'm just curious to see the behind the scenes uh, of that. And I'm sure a lot of other people are as well. Yeah, I mean um, I've talked to him before about – different stocks and positions and things like that. He doesn't, uh, he doesn't, you know, he's never come to me and said, uh, you know, here's an idea I think we should do or anything like that. He's pretty hands off and just lets me run with it. So, um, what we do talk about when we get together, we do, we will talk about more of the macro and kind of things that are going on. And, and he always has lots of opinions about that. Nothing that anybody who reads his stuff would, you know, be any surprise. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I guess I don't really have too much to say about that because they're really, he doesn't, you know, he doesn't ever say, you know, do this or don't do that or, 
He just lets me go where I think the. Uh, I mean, he buys into the overall philosophy. So I think mm-hmm. he likes his, the way I, the way I invest is I invest as if I was a business person looking to buy that whole business, and I focus on things like the incentives of the people involved and the ownership, you know, who's got control. And um, it's very much a private investment sort of mentality, and it sort of grows out of my experience too from banking and working with uh, private businesses and, and valuing them back then, and I just take that same approach and apply it to public markets. So I think he, yeah, trusts, I... That, he trusts that approach. It's kind of the way he thinks about it. I mean, we're both very skeptical about the market. You know, we'll, we always say that the stock market is a market of secondhand goods, and the only reason you're able to buy a share of a company is because the original owner didn't want it. And so, you know, why is that? Um, of course, it's a generalization, and there's not – there are some businesses that are very much worth owning, and the, and the original ownership group still has a substantial stake, whether they're family or whether they're management teams or even activist investors will, will ride coattails of them. I mean, I like getting involved in some of the situations where activists have a big block of stock and they're making some things happen, whether they're divestitures or stuff like that. So I think, you know, I think Bill buys into that general approach and – He's also well, we have the same mind of general skepticism about what people can know, and so we don't, you know, pretend to know things we can't know, or and we're skeptical about what other people claim to know, and uh, it seems to be seems to work out in a good partnership so far. No, that's cool, and I appreciate you sharing that, right? Because every a lot of people ask me how's how's it to work with for Kramer behind the scenes and stuff like that, and they just like that from a story perspective, and even I'm interested in it because. Yeah, Bill Bonner is, uh, you know, again, great guy. He's the leader in this industry and stuff. And just working side by side. That's got to be really, really cool for you. So, um, all right, last last thing I promise here, because I love talking to you and it's been a while, is you shared some ideas. Is there anything else, maybe a sector or another idea or anything? like? And you did share plenty of ideas. You said at least three or four of them, I believe. But is there any maybe sector that you're looking at or individual stocks that you say, hey, you know what, Th- these look pretty cool right now I'm buying into or anything you could share? Because that's what people love from you because you set the bar so high because you always give us stocks that people really never heard of. And they love that from you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know, um, well, let's see. I mentioned Maersk before. That's one that we that we have. And what's interesting about that is uh, they've just recently – we bought it before this announcement, but they announced that they're going to spin off some of their oil-related assets. So what's interesting about Maersk is that they have something like $15 billion in capital coming back to them. They've, they're selling uh, – they're selling. Uh, they have a big stake in Total Oil. They're selling that. They're selling a bunch of things. And so when it's all said and done, they're going to have more cash than debt. And and they'll probably, uh, you know, in the past, what they've done is they've done special dividends. Uh, they may do buybacks. All kinds of good things can happen in this situation. And and just recently announced a spinoff of those assets. So I think that's a, an interesting play. Again, you're getting something somewhere around the bottom of the cycle, and you're going to get a a free spin-off in there, which could be, which could be interesting. Um, as far as other sectors go, uh, you know, like I say, it's kind of eclectic, and we are finding some interesting things in Europe. Like, for example, and some of these, um, you know, they're easy to buy. For example, one that comes to mind is Telcom Italia, which um, trades on the New York Stock Exchange. Telcom Italia is interesting because you have two billionaires basically fighting over it. Um, Vincent Bolloré is a French industrialist, and he has a, a good-sized stake in Telcom Italia, and then Paul Singer at Elliott came in after him and bought a pretty large stake, and they both had competing plans for what they want to do with the company, or they want to spin off their wireless assets, do this or that, but you can buy that stock today for well under what both those guys paid, and neither of them are dummies. Both of them have excellent long-term track records. And uh, I, so I really like uh, Telcom Italia. Stock is super cheap just on the numbers anyway because of all the stuff that's going on in Italy. Um, but behind the scenes, I think that's another name that I think looks interesting here. So, Chris, if someone wants to find more information from you, how can they do it? And, you know, I know you're writing a newsletter, you're doing lots of things out there. You speak at conferences, you travel the world. Uh, you know, people love to follow you. And you always, uh, again, they love your opinion and stuff. But how can they find out more information if, uh, if they want to learn more about you? Sure. Um, well, you can head over. You can Google Bonner and Partners. That's the uh, publisher of my newsletters, uh, bonnerandpartners.com. Uh, you can also follow me on Twitter, and the handle is at Chris W. Mayer, M-A-Y-E-R. And I post some interesting things there, research.
research and other ideas I, I come across. All right, Chris. Well, you know, we'll leave it there. And look, I usually try to keep these interviews at 20, maybe 25 minutes. And this probably went to 35 minutes only because I love talking to you and getting your ideas. And uh, I really appreciate you coming. I know how busy you are. And, and you know, my listeners really respect you. And they were asking a lot. And uh, hopefully you'll continue to come on because they love your picks and they love you. So I really appreciate it, bud. Well, great, Frank. Sure. I uh, always love talking to you as well. Interesting conversations. And i um, happy to be on. Thanks for having me. All right, guys. Great stuff from Chris. Awesome ideas as always. I take one of those, throw them in the, in the All-Star portfolio. But more important, I, I opened up with the All-Star portfolio. Chris is the third analyst probably in the last three months that talked about shipping. Another thing you could track, which is interesting. How many people are talking about shipping? But three different analysts, experts, are now talking about getting into shipping, an industry no one's really talking about. Kind of when I was talking about getting into department store retailers October, November, and now everybody's in them when they're probably 50, 60, 70% higher because they're breaking out even more now and, you know, a lot of rotation into that, which is probably going to stop. If, if I was, if you own retailers right now, I'd definitely take profits in some of them. They're up tremendously and you're going to see rotate. There has been rotation. I mean, this is stuff that I, that I track through uh, a lot of the research engines. I lose Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan and stuff like that, but you're seeing rotation out of tech and one of those rotations are into retail right now. Uh, and I think that's going to switch back. I think this is a short-term trend because they've gone up so much. And you might see that rotation maybe into some shipping stocks or things like that. But uh, you know, I'd probably be taking profits right now on a lot of retailers since everyone in the world all of a sudden is bullish, which is normal when they're at the top. Nobody likes them at the bottom. That's why I love the All-Star Portfolio where you have people coming on telling you to buy things that everybody hates. It's not exciting. Nobody's going to talk about it. But that's how you make the most money, by buying these depressed sectors so out of favor where your risk is limited and just a slight positive is going to send these things up tremendously like we saw in retail. But buying things that are out of favor is not marketable. So you're not going to see a lot of guys on TV talk about this, but you're going to see things like that on this podcast. So three guys, three people, three of the analysts, pretty much the last three months have recommended shipping, which is kind of interesting. Anyway, let's move on to my educational segment. And it has to do with biotech stocks. I've been talking about biotech stocks lately because I've been finding a lot of value in a lot of these names have gotten smoked and I've yeah, been going over strategies and how a lot, you know, FDA approved these. You know, just, it's a good time to really buy these things when they get crushed sometimes or they're going into, you know, phase two studies or phase three studies and they disappoint. And you'll see investors just run to the exits, right? Even though they don't analyze the data. And one of the things they can look at, again, I talked about this the past couple of weeks is they'll look at the data and say, the FDA may say, well, we want a little bit more information on this, and they have to submit it like six months later, and you'll see a stock drop 50, 60%. Sometimes these things fall below cash. You're getting their pipeline for free, and you know it's, it's great. As long as you're really analyzing the reason why that stock fell 50%, and if it's, they're going to discontinue that drug, you know, don't bother looking at it anymore. Look at something else. You're better off. They're getting rid of that platform. But if, they're, if it's something really small that they just have to get right and test more people, it's only going to take six months, uh, it's a way to really generate massive returns. That's one strategy. This strategy is different. And I wanted to mention to you because it's, it's exciting and, and you see it. You see it more often than not. And it's when biotech stocks crash. They crash after they receive FDA approval on a signature drug. And you, most of the time, almost a lot of times you see is human genome. You even saw this is cell gene early in their career, uh, early when that business started, 2001, 2002. Um, cancer drug got approved. I mean, you see the ups and downs. And it's kind of amazing. This happens really with small cap biotech companies when maybe their first drug gets approved by the FDA. And when you see the phase three data and it's positive, this is when these things really start running out. Because once you pass phase three, it's just a matter of time pretty much before you get FDA approval. and when you get FDA approval, what happens? You have all these analysts come out. They have inflated target prices, right? They say the stock's going to go through the roof and now because you, you're a real company, right? You're going to generate sales, and they say you know, the sales are going to be X amount the first year, second year. They're usually really inflated. And, you know, again, you could understand why they're so inflated because a lot of these investment firms, I mean, if you look at it, uh, they're incentivized to provide – positive research or positive forecasts on small cap biotech companies, especially in most companies, I guess, but especially if they receive FDA approval, because these are companies that are going to have to raise tons of money to buy facilities, hire new employees, delivery systems, sales agents. 
And what are they going to do? Well, they're going to go to the investment banks. And I could tell you the investment banks that have a negative opinion and think your stock is a sell, that's not the guy I'm going to go to and say, hey, I'll pay you some investment fees. You want to raise money for us? No, you're going to go to the guys with the most optimistic reports. And a lot of these come out right after they get FDA approval. Because now you stamp of approval. Now this drug is going to be sold in the market. Everything else is kind of like this discounted cash flow model. It's probably by 2027, they're going to generate. Now the FDA approval, everything changes. Because you know what happens to these companies? They have to change their business model. They have to. And if you look at the drug discovery, that whole process, I mean, it's a big process. You have pre-discovery, then you have drug discovery where they have a bunch of compounds and throwing them against, we'll see what sticks. And then they have preclinical, they're testing on animals. And then they go to the clinical trials, which you guys are probably familiar with the most. That's phase one, phase two, phase three. In phase one, you have to have you know, 20, 80 people in there. And it's, a, it's, a, it's not that long, basically. And it's, it's, it's all about time and, and the study participants, basically. So phase one trials is 20, 80 people tested over several months. Phase two is more like several hundred people tested over two years. And then if that's positive, phase three requires more, usually more than 1,000 people tested over several years. And once you get that phase three approval, boom. And that's why when you look at the drug process, people don't know, it takes 12 years. Like these stocks, the drugs come off patent at the 20 years, but it takes an average of 12, 13 years to get the drug to market. And it costs at least a billion and a half on average, right? There's lots of studies. Some of them have even higher than 2 billion because of all these studies before we even get to sell that drug. And when you do, you only have a few years to sell it before generics copycat it. It's a crazy industry. That's why they raise prices significantly going into when, you know, the last few years until their patent comes off expiration. Every drug company does this. But the phase that people really don't talk about is the one after phase three. Like you have the FDA re review period. And during this stage, the company must submit uh, something called a new drug application. Stay with me here because it's very important if you, especially if you invest in biotech stocks. So basically, you're highlighting all this, putting all the data of everything you reported, and you're submitting it to the FDA, and then they approve it. And you know, most of the time, they go to the six to ten person panel. They approve it. Again, phase three studies are good. It's most likely going to get approved. And then what happens? Because this is a strategy here, and it's called the post marketing stage. This is called phase four. Nobody really talks about phase four. Phase four is phase four. Me, phase three. I'm used to phase two. Phase four. Phase four is post marketing. It's the most critical phase for investors. That, this is the phase you should care about the most. It's when a small cap biotech company, they have to change their business model. And most of them fail miserably when they do this. Miserably. And their stocks get destroyed. Because in the first phases and all that stuff I just talked about, biotech companies are all about research, testing, doctors, scientists, you know, they usually running the show. Their job is to make sure you know, that signature drug is safe and effective for patients and get it past phase three. And once a drug passes that test, you get FDA approval, it's a home ball game. Hey, imagine you need to find facilities to manufacture the drug at mass now. You find a delivery service to transport the drug to the end user, whatever it is. Higher advertising agencies, they need a background in healthcare. You see the healthcare commercials now, right? It's a minute commercial, 15 minutes is on the drug, uh, 15 seconds is on the drug, and, and then you know, 45 seconds is on the risks of you know, if you know, you're driving a car or suicide or this, you gamble, the, everything that could possibly be put in there. As long as they say it, they can't get in trouble for it. So you might as well say a billion things that you know, all these risks. As long as you know, it's mentioned there and disclosed. Again, that's our business. All you have to do is disclose it. I told you, I told you, if you drive a car about 50 miles an hour near a cliff, you might just fall, jump off the cliff or pass out or whatever. It's right there, and you did it. So no, you can't sue us. <laughs> it's crazy. It's only you disclose it. You have to hire hundreds of employees, sales agents to help sell the drug. And remember, right after the FDA approval, there's still no money coming in the first couple of months until you start producing it, right? And you have to cover massive costs. That's where it comes to the investment firms. They're probably these, providing these inflated forecasts. Because you're gonna have to, they know you're gonna have to raise money to hire those new employees, buy the facilities, marketing, manufacture the drug. And more important companies then, and this is doctors and scientists, they don't know this. They have to meet with insurance companies to see if their drug's gonna be covered under certain health care plans. And if insurer refuses to cover the drug, patients are gonna have to pay out of pocket, and that's a massive sales risk, especially if the drug is super expensive. They're not gonna buy it. 
And even if insurers cover it, management needs to know and get familiar with the reimbursement process. I mean, it's crucial for public companies that report sales earnings every quarter now because you're a real company. And as you know, delays in these payments result in the big salesmen. And what happens? It destroys the stock, especially early on, because it provides uncertainty. And investors are going to question, hey, you know, these delays, are they temporary? Is it caused by insurers? We saw one of our stocks go through this. This is a stock that was up 45% for us, came all the way back down, we're down 30%. Now it's up 50, 60%. It's an awesome company, but this is the process. This is one of the risks that we had to deal with. So I'm telling you these lessons, these things that I've learned from. Not because I'm some genius. and re This is like real life stuff. And the company's fantastic, but those payments from insurers didn't, weren't coming in quick enough. And people started doubting and saying, wait a minute, are they covering it? They were, but they just, you know, those payments came later than expected because they're a new company. But again, those investors are going to say, wait, is it temporary or is this, you know, more long term? But doctors may not be prescribing that drug to as many patients as expected. Now you're going to see, you know, the, the stock fall out of bed. So I think you get a point. At least you should get the point now. You need to go through it so much and go over the details. But it's important because there's so many companies. Human Genome was a company that we made a fortune on. That the lupus drug got approved. One of the first drugs for lupus. It was like 30, 35 dollars. It fell to eight. It fell to eight. It was trading like not too far from cash, uh, the cash on uh, the balance sheet. Plus, they had a decent pipeline. Glaxo already had a 25% stake in the company, I think. And I said, why wouldn't Glaxo just go out and purchase this stock for $10, $11? Three weeks later, they actually did that. It was one of the best calls I've ever had. Lucky with the timing. The stock I looked at for a while, I liked it pretty much 10, 11, fell out of eight. I was like, I got to recommend this thing. It's a joke. I mean, they actually have an FDA approved drug where this stock was trading in the 20s without an FDA approval. Now it's $8 with an FDA approval and you're generating sales. And if you look back at all the companies, if you look back at some of the biggest drugs, are you going back? I tested This is a lot of research on this from where they got FDA approval. You look at a drug, Avastin, Keytruda. Avastin's a, a Genentech, Keytruda, uh, immunotherapy drug, Merck. I mean, you talk about Rituxin, Humira, biggest drug in, in the world. Their first year of sales in 2002 with 250 million. Disappointing. That's disappointing for Abby V, a big company. Now they're $18 billion they generated last year. But the first year out of the gate for even these drugs with these big companies, the first year sales almost always disappoint. And when I say disappoint, they fall well short of analysts giving you an opportunity because what happens? These stocks crash after FDA approval, and you get to buy them for dirt cheap, cheaper than when they didn't even have FDA approval. If you're a Curse Your Venture subscriber, you're getting an amazing pick a stock that was $80 that's now 20 and it was 80 before the FDA approved their drug. Now they approved their drug. It fell all the way down to 20 bucks. You're getting the pipeline for free, trading around 20 bucks, $6 a share in cash. I mean, it's kind of amazing. And, and they had their pipeline. They have one, two, three, four drugs in phase two, phase three studies. It's incredible. But this is what you want to look at. You need to find out. I love to have all these biotech stocks on my radar that get destroyed. Because when they get destroyed, dig in and see why. Because investors don't. Most don't. The so funds or whatever, they run to the eggs. It's giving you an opportunity to buy these things dirt cheap. And I'm telling you, we did with New Link, which is no longer in our uh, Curse of Research Advisory Portfolio. We recommend that stock. It went up 180% in like a couple months. And the stock fell out of bed from 50 uh, tremendously. I think it was like 7 or 8. Came out, went right to 18. We sold half. It came back down again. Sold the rest. We're out of position for like 150% gain, but 180% in a few weeks. And it's kind of amazing. We've done this before. It wasn't luck. We did it with Human Genome. We've done it with other picks as well. But try to keep biotech on your radar because a lot of these names get destroyed. And if you look at the reasons why they get destroyed, a lot of times that's temporary. And just investors just run to the exits without asking questions. That creates an amazing an amazing buying opportunity for you. And maybe you want to also see some insider buying as well, which I'm seeing in the stock that we recommend for Curse Adventure Opportunities. So I think it's a tremendous opportunity. So hopefully that educational segment was not too long. I'm trying to help you guys out to be better investors. And I do like biotech right now. I think it's a fantastic sector. And the last two picks actually in my Curse Adventure Opportunity were biotech. And well, before is all the way up. I think it's up like 15, 20% already. Good sector to start looking for stock. Nobody's talking about it. Out of favor. A lot of cheap names I'm finding. Anyway, guys. Lots of digest, lots of ideas, lots of stuff going on, really great stuff. But that's it for me. And thank you so much for listening. Really appreciate it. I'll see you guys in seven days. Take care. 
The information presented on Wall Street Unplugged is the opinion of its hosts and guests. You should not base your investment decision solely on this broadcast. Remember, it's your money and your responsibility. Wall Street Unplugged, produced by the Choose Yourself Podcast Network, the leader in podcasts produced to help you choose yourself.